Hello, brethren and friends. Welcome back to present Truth to SDA and Sabbath School Discussion. We are happy to be here again with you this week to look at this week's lesson and to share with you and to learn from you as well. I am Sister Aiken and with me is Sister Cherry. And together we'll be taking you through this week's lesson which is number seven, your mercy reaches unto the heavens. And who have not experienced God's mercy? We all have. It is the reason why, why we are here today, because we have experienced his great love and his mercy. But have you ever wondered what it means your mercy reaches unto the heavens? Well, as we get deeper into this week's lesson, the meaning will come clear to us. So without much ado, we will have a word of prayer or opening prayer. So let's pray. Our loving Father and our God, we are truly thankful that we can come and learn again to study thy word and to share with thy people across the world. We place ourselves into thy capable hands now, Lord. May self be hid behind the cross and may Jesus alone be seen and heard. We ask, Lord, of thee to send thy Holy Spirit to tabernacle with us, to be with thy people across the world. And we ask, Lord, that you will take full control of the internet, the networks. Lord, sometimes they misbehave. Sometimes there's interruptions. But we pray, dear Father, that there will be no interruption during this recording so that thy people can hear clearly that your name will be honored and glorified and all of us blessed. We thank thee again in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we'll move into the next page to see the text. And we have Psalm 136, Psalm 51, Psalm 130, Psalm 130, sorry, Psalm 113, Psalm 123. And our memory text is Psalm 57, 9 and 10. And it says, I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations, for thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds. So here we see where the topic for this week's lesson came from. His mercy reaches unto the heavens, and it says so in Psalm 57, verse 10. Now the psalmist realized that they are spiritually poor, and have nothing good to offer to God. Even we ourselves are in the same situation. So that is, they have nothing in and of themselves that would recommend them before God's holy throne. And neither do we. We are like dust. We are just dust in his presence. The psalmist understood that they, as do all of us, need grace. God's grace. In short, they need the gospel and we need it too. The Psalms stress the fact that people are fully dependent on God's mercy. Fortunately, God's mercy is everlasting as evidenced in both God's creation and the history of God's people. And as we get into Psalm 136, we will find that out. So before the everlasting God, Human life is as transient as grass, but God pities humans and renews their strength, and in him they have the promise of eternity. I would really like to rephrase this, these statements you know, and say, we have, humans meaning we, in him we have the promise of eternity. So I would really like us to put us in place of these pronouns, there and they and them. Us, for me, is a better way of saying it. Yes, the authors of the lesson has their reason, and I am not disputing that, but you know, we have to make it personal and get closer home, okay? So we'll turn the page and see what we can learn concerning the mercy of God that reaches unto the heaven. So inspiration says, from the book that I may know him, page 280, there is danger of not making Christ's teaching a personal matter. 
of not receiving them as though they were addressed to us personally. Exactly what I was saying a little earlier too. In his words of instruction, Jesus means me, so very much so. I may appropriate to myself his, mer his merits, his death, his cleansing blood as fully as though there were not another sinner in the world for whom Christ died. This is how it should be, brethren. God's word is speaking to us personally, and God is a personal God. So let's read from the voice in speech and song, page 465, paragraph 1. And it says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Such was the spirit that pervaded Israel's song of deliverance. And it is the spirit that should dwell in the hearts of all who love and fear God. In freeing our souls from the bondage of sin, God has wrought for us a deliverance greater than that of the Hebrews at the Red Sea. Like the Hebrew host, we should praise the Lord with heart and soul and voice for his wonderful works to the children of men. Those who dwell upon God's great mercies are not unmindful of his lesser gifts. Sorry, let me read that again. Those who dwell upon God's great mercies and are not unmindful of his lesser gifts will put on the girdle of gladness and make melody in their hearts to the Lord. Praise his name. So we need to give God praises more than we really do right now. Let's move forward and get into a little bit more details. So the experience of the psalmist is the experience that all may gain by receiving God's word through nature and through revelation. He says, Thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faith faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. Psalm 57, 9 and 10 from another version. And we can say the same thing. We need to sing it more often, brethren. For truly, God's mercy are higher than the highest heavens, deeper than the deepest sea, wider than whatever width we can imagine in our hearts. God's mercy is tremendous. Let's move forward and learn some more here. So, when David moved the ark to Jerusalem, he sang, For his mercy endureth forever. And we can read about it in 1 Chronicles 16, 34. When the ark was placed in Solomon's temple, the Levites sang, For his mercy endureth forever. When the divine fire consumed the holocaust, they repeated, For his mercy endureth forever. When Jehoshaphat went out to battle, the Levites sang, For his mercy endures forever. 2 Chronicles 20:21. 20, when Zerubbabel laid the foundation of the new temple, it was sung, For his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. The, psalm, the, sorry, the same phrase is repeated in Psalms 100, 103, 106, 107, 118, 136, and 138. Are we repeating it today, brethren? This is a question we need to ask ourselves. Jeremiah prophesied that when Jerusalem was restored, it would be sung, For his mercy endureth forever. And I can't sing it right now, For his mercy endureth forever. Hadn't it been for his mercy, I would not be here with you at this moment. Praise the Lord. What does it mean to me that God's love is eternal? We'll be seeing We'll be getting into these details as we go forward into the lesson. We'll also be learning what does that love consist of? What benefits does it bring me? How can I respond to that love? So these are questions which, as we go through this week's lesson, we'll find answers to. We'll also be looking at God's love. Love that lasts forever. Love that transforms. Forgiving love. Human response to the love of God. We'll be looking at that as well. And we'll look at under that heading, praise and trust, blessing and admiration. Oh, God is so 
worthy of our praise and our admiration and adoration. So we'll move now into Sunday's lesson and Sister Cherry will take you through. Sister Cherry, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Sister Akins. So, in Sunday, we have his mercy endures forever. And we got a little bit of that on the Sabbath. But we are going to go into Sunday and see how much more we can gather from the text that is given in Psalms 136. We're going to see what inspiration has to say concerning it so that we do not bring out our own interpretation, but only that which heaven approves. What thought predominates in the Psalms? Where does the Psalmist find evidence for his prevalent claim? And we are also going to look at how does the image of Jesus on the cross, dying as a substitute for our sins, most powerfully reveal the great truth about God that his love endures forever. Psalms 136 summons God's people to praise the Lord for his mercy as revealed in creation. When you read through Psalms 136, which we are going to read, read through and get more information. And in Israel's history, mercy conveys God's goodness and loyalty to his creation and to his covenant with Israel. The psalm, the psalm shows that God's immense power and magnificence are grounded in his steadfast love. So let us go. Let us dive deeper into it. Now, we are going to read Psalms 136, verses 1 to 60. It says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto God, unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords for his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great wonders for his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens for his mercy endureth forever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters for his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. And to him that smote Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endureth forever, and brought out Israel from among them. For his mercy endureth forever. With a strong hand, with a stretched out arm. For his mercy endureth forever. And made Israel to pass through the midst of it. For his mercy endureth forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his horse in the Red Sea. For his mercy endureth forever. To him which led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. Every verse you read, the psalmist stretch there, his mercy endureth forever. Even when we think the Lord is harsh in his judgment, we don't know as God knows. All we know as the psalmist does is that did is that God's mercy endure it forever. This should console our hearts wherever we are listening from that the mercy of God endures forever and this should give us hope. Let us continue with verses 17. To him, it says, with small great kings for his mercy endure it forever and slew famous kings for his mercy endure it forever. Sihon, king of Amorites, for his mercy endured forever. 
and of the king of Bashan, for his mercy endured forever, and give their land for an heritage, for his mercy endured forever, even an heritage unto Israel, his servants, for his mercy endured forever, who remembered us in our low estate, for his mercy endured forever, and had redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endured forever, who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endured forever, or give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endured forever. When you read this Psalms, it sums up from creation to the end, from how God created us, how he laid the foundation to save in us. His mercy endured forever. And everything that God does, we should see his mercy. Because that is the God we serve. We serve a God of mercy. Now we are reading from the book that I may know him. It tells us, the Lord is good and his mercy endured forever. Did we just confirm that? That's right. It goes on to say, I will praise him who is the light of my countenance and my God. He is the source of all efficiency and power. Why do we not praise him by speaking words of hope and comfort to others? Now, this is a question because oftentimes when we open our mouth to speak, we don't speak hope and comfort. It's most times we condemn and judge. Why are our lips so silent when it comes to serving him? It says, what speech is a gift of heaven, and it should be used in sounding for the praises of him who had called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh, how much good would be accomplished, accomplished were God honored by all who profess to be Christians. The light of the world is shining upon men in richest blessing. Every provision has been made for the supplying of our temporal and spiritual needs. Yet how little thanksgiving the giver receives. When you read this, it shows you even more what the psalmist is saying of God's mercy and how it endures forever. We don't deserve it. We hardly praise God. Sometimes we wake up in the morning and we, we don't even thank God for his for waking up, for keeping us in health and strength, taking us through the day. We take these things for granted. And the Lord still keep us because what? His mercy endure it forever. Now, we are not going to read verses 17 to 20 again. But it says, the, Psalms 126 is the autophonal song. When you read it, when it says his mercy endure it forever, it sounds like you can sing it right. In each of its 26 verses, one part of the chorus prays God and the other part answers with the reason that justifies that praise because his what? Mercies endure it forever. Let us give thanks unto the Lord for he is good and his mercy endure it forever. What kind of thanksgiving shall we keep? One to ourselves, bestowing all our benefits upon ourselves and receiving the attention of others, but bringing no thanksgiving offering to God? Do we offer thanksgiving to God, not of bullocks and lambs and of turtle doves, but our heart, by our praise, showed up how much we appreciate God and how much we are thankful. This is idolatry of the most offensive character in the sight of a jealous God. We have our God that deserve all the praise of which we do not, but yet we do not give him. The one who, if he withdraws his blessings and his mercies from us, we perish. It's because of his mercies why we endure it forever. So we are moving along quickly. Now, the Hebrew word translate mercy can be translated loving kindness. So we see the word they love. It was it is love that moves him. God is love. That's the very nature of the God we serve. Christ Object Lessons Inspiration tells us in bringing forth Israel from Egypt, 
the Lord again manifested his power and his mercy. His wonderful works in their deliverance from bondage and his dealings with them in their travels through the wilderness were not for their benefit alone. These were to be as an object lesson to the surrounding nations. The Lord revealed himself as a God above all human, human authority and greatness. The signs and wonders he wrought in behalf of his people showed his power over nature and over the greatest of those who worship nature. He led them through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought. Deuteronomy 8, 5, 15. He brought them forth water out of a rock of flints and feed them with the corn of heaven. Psalm 7, 8, 24. For said Moses, the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found them in, the desert, in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye, as an eagle stirred up her nest, fluttered over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them under her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. Deuteronomy 32, 9 to 12. Thus he brought them unto himself that they might dwell as under the shadow of the Most High. And we see what Israel did. Every chance, every opportunity they got, they turned from God. But yet his mercy endured forever, right? How does the image of Jesus on the cross dying as a substitute for our sins most powerfully reveal the great truth about God that his mercy, his love, his truth endures forever? Now we are reading from inspiration and I like to say inspiration. I don't use the term Ellen White as most people say because it's not Sister White. Sister White is writing what? under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So this is inspiration's counsel to us. It says, through the cross, we learn that the Heavenly Father loves us with a love that is infinite. Can we wonder that Paul exclaimed, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is there for us to boast? Even if the disciples healed the sick, and raise the dead. What is it them to boast? Did they do it of themselves? No, it is God. It is God. It is our privilege also to glory in the cross. Our privilege to give ourselves wholly to him who gave himself for us. Then, with the light that streams from Calvary shining in our face, we may go forth to reveal this light to those in darkness. When in consequence of transgression, Adam and Eve were cut off from all hope when justice demanded the death of the sinner, Christ gave himself as a sacrifice. Are we not seeing the mercy of God here? Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiate of our sins, the propitiation, propitiation for our sins. I'm trying to pronounce that properly. It's very important. <laughs> All we, like sheep have, gone, sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Haven't <laughs> we seen mercy here? Yeah. Well, while we should bear our sins, his on him who knew no sin, who have never sinned, take on the iniquity of all who would enter this world. Aren't we not seeing the mercy of God? Read first John 4 10, Isaiah 53, 6. And this is coming from councils to parents and teachers and students. And here is where we wrapped up Sunday's lesson and go over to Sister Akins. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry.
beautiful. His mercy endures forever. So, brethren, let us take up the praise of God here below. Let us unite with the heavenly company above. For we know that they keep praising God. In the book of Revelation, we see the judgment scene spread out before us. In chapters 4 going along and the, the, the host of company in that judgment hall keeps saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, honor and power and thanksgiving are due unto thy holy name. Read it, brethren. Go look through the book of Revelation. I don't remember the verses, but chapter 4 and chapter 5 and onwards. They are there. It is written there. So please, let us search these scriptures through and see how the heavenly hosts who have never sinned praise God and we who have sinned and is experiencing his mercy need to give him more praise than they who had not sinned she said Sherry thank you so very much now we will go on into Monday's lesson creating me a clean heart oh God well the topic is simply creating me a clean heart but you know Psalm 51 is one of our favorite. Most of us can attest to that fact. We have read that psalm over and over and over again, time and time again, yes? So, why does the psalmist appeal to God's mercy? That is a question we are asked based on Psalm 51, 1 to 5. And also, we'll be looking at 51, 6 to 19. And the question there for us is, how is forgiveness of sin portrayed here? What is the goal of divine forgiveness? So we'll be looking at these. And we'll also be looking at what hope there is for us. Since God has forgiven David of adultery, deception, and murder, Breaking the whole law, for if you break one, you, have, you are guilty of all. Yes? When we break one, we are guilty of all. So we'll be looking at the hope that is there for us, seeing that we also are sinners. All right? So King David pours out his heart before the Lord, asking for the forgiveness of sin during the spiritually darkest moments in his life. And we can read more about it in Second Samuel 12. So, forgiveness is God's extraordinary gift of grace, the result of the multitude of your tender mercies, according to Psalm 51.1. King David appeals to God to deal with him not in accordance with what his sin deserves, but in accordance with his divine character, namely his mercy, faithfulness, and compassion. No, brethren, here is something that we need to emulate. We ought to be God's servants. Are we God's servants? If we are God's servants, then we will behave even as God himself has behaved. We should be pleading as David did, not necessarily for our own sins now, but for God to put his own heart in us so that when some people sin against us, we can be as merciful to them as God has been merciful to David. For David is here asking God or thanking God too for not treating him as he really deserved. How often we treat people as we think they deserve. But that is wrong. We should treat them with pity, with a forgiving heart, with mercy as God has done. So let's turn the page and get into some more details. Creating my clean heart. Reading from the faith I live by, page 129, paragraph 2, God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation. It is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming from sin. That means restoration. It is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. David had the true conception of forgiveness when he prayed. Creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The Lord purifies the heart very much as we air a room. We do not close the doors and windows and throw in some purifying substance, but we open the doors and throw wide the windows. 
and let heaven's purifying atmosphere flow in. The windows of impulse, of feeling, must be opened up toward heaven, and the dust of selfishness and earthliness must be expelled. Praise the Lord. Did you hear that, Bridget? The attitudes that we would have that would prevent us from forgiving our neighbor who trespass against us. This is what is being termed here, the impulse of feeling. The, the windows of impulse of feeling must be opened up toward heaven so that the dust of selfishness and earthliness must be expelled. So, inspiration continues, the grace of God must sweep through the chambers of the mind. The imagination must have heavenly themes for contemplation. And every element of the nature must be purified and vitalized by the Spirit of God. So this is why God has forgiven us. We need to be transformed. We need to be restored to the, his perfect image. The same image that Adam was created with when God said on the sixth day. What did he say? Very good. So let's move forward and see how much more we can learn concerning this transformation that needs to take place in our hearts. Read Psalm 51, 1 to 5. So let's read these verses. And we'll answer the question, why does the psalmist appeal to God's mercy? To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, Wash me truly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. So the psalmist here has realized his sinful condition. Yes, Psalm 51 was written by David after he had gone into Bathsheba. Nathan the prophet came to him from that moment, remorse gnawed at David's soul. You see, before the prophet of God came to show him the matter, he had felt good about himself, as many of us would feel good about ourselves when we do something wrong. And not even thinking that it is something wrong because we have satisfied our ego. So we feel good. But when the man of God came to him and said, this is what has happened. What do you think we should do? David pronounced judgment on himself. And when he heard that that is what he had done, pronounced judgment on himself. When he understood that the prophet had come to reprove him of his sin. I can imagine he must have felt like he could have bored the earth and gone right through like the rabbits. But he couldn't. So remorse gnawed at David's soul. Now he opened his heart before God and confessed his sin without, without mitigating or justifying it. Yes, unlike us today, we justify our sins and we try to prove God a liar. But David acknowledged his sin and he was truly sorry about it. Inspiration says from Patriarchs and Prophets, David's repentance was sincere and deep. There was no effort to palliate his crime, no desire to escape the judgments threatened, inspired his prayer. But he saw the enormity of his transgression against God. He saw the defilement of his soul. He loathed his sin. It was not for pardon only that he prayed, but for purity of heart. And this is how we must pray. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 725 and 726. Let's move forward and get into a little bit more detail concerning David's um Well, not David, no, but creating it. Create in me a clean heart. For this is what we all need. A clean heart. We need to pray this prayer daily. So let's read Psalm 51, 6 to 19. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, 
and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Let me pause a moment. Did you know, brethren, that this is what we do many a time? We cast away those who have wronged us. David is pleading with God and asking him to cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. But what we do, we do with our family members, friends, and brethren who wrongs us. We cast them away, and whatever it is we had given them, we take it back. Now, so it done. Isn't it right? Isn't it what we do? We need to take a page out of Psalm 51, or a few verses. The whole Psalm, we need to take it, we need to meditate upon it seriously. We need to confess our sins and ask God to purge us with his up and create in us a clean heart. Let's continue reading. So verse 13, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners sing a load of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God. Thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall, they, then shall they offer bullocks upon that altar. When we have confessed and forsaken sin, then we can speak the truth of God clearly so that those who are in darkness may be able to hear us. Yes, and let me repeat in case you had not heard clearly. David prays, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. David wants sin out of his heart, and he's asking the Lord to remove it for him. Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. If we bring our offerings with covetousness, the Lord cannot accept it. And if we bring it in hypocrisy, the Lord cannot accept it. We must have a clean heart. So we need to be praying continually for God to give us a clean heart, to purge us and to help us to stay purged. Let's move forward and get into some more details. So this passage in David's history, Inspiration Saves from Patriarchs and Prophets, is full of significance to the repenting sinner. It is for us, brethren. It is one of the most forcible illustrations given us of the struggles and temptations of humanity and of genuine repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Through all the ages, it has proved a source of encouragement to souls that having fallen into sin, were struggling under the burden of their guilt. Thousands of the children of God who have been betrayed into sin when ready to give up to despair have remembered how David's sincere repentance and confession 
were accepted by God. Notwithstanding, he suffered for his transgression. Yes, because his sin comes with a consequence. Every sin comes with a consequence. So while we are forgiven, we may still have to pay or face the consequence of the sin. And they also have taken charge, sorry, and they also have taken courage to repent and try again to walk in the way of God's commandments. Whoever under the reproof of God will humble his soul with confession and repentance, as did David, may be sure that there is hope for him. Whoever will in faith accept God's promise will find pardon. The Lord will never cast away one truly repentant soul. So here we have a question answered again. That there is hope for us. If we will sincerely repent and or if we will sincerely confess and repent. For confession comes before repentance. God will pardon us. Let's read now from Ye Shall Receive Power, page 56, paragraph 2. Creating me a clean heart. This is beginning right at the very foundation of Christian character. For out of the heart are the issues of life. If all ministers and people would see to it that their hearts are right with God, we should see much larger results from the, from the labor put forth. Yes. We would truly be a lighthouse on top of the mountain. Inspiration continues. The more important and responsible your work, the greater the necessity that you have clean hearts. The needed grace is provided and the power of the Holy Spirit will work with every effort you make in this direction. During the Levitical system, the priests, those who were at the head, had to carry the most expensive offering. And here inspiration is saying to us that the more important and responsible the work we have to do, the greater the necessity that we should have clean hearts. Especially if we are in leadership position for the people love to follow the leader without even reading the scriptures for themselves. So brethren, may we strive to have clean hearts so those whom we are leading will follow in the footsteps of Christ as we ourselves will be doing. So, another important statement concerning the hope that exists for us. The psalmist says, A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. John writes, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, the verse continues. In inspiration continues, the only reason that we have not remission of sin is that we have not acknowledged to him whom we have wounded by our transgressions. Bridgin, this is very serious, and we need to ponder this carefully. The only reason that we have not remission of sin is that we have not acknowledged to him whom we have wounded by our transgressions. If we hide sin in our hearts, our prayers cannot be answered, so we need to confess them. Yes? Him whom we have pierced by our sins, that we are at fault and in, the, in need of mercy. The confession that is the outpouring of the inmost soul will find its way to the heart of infinite pity. For the Lord is nigh unto him that is of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. And remember, his mercy endureth forever. And this is where we end Monday's lesson. Sister Cherry, could you take us through Tuesday, please? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sister Akins. I like, I love how you bring up Monday, especially with um David's situation. You know, if David didn't do anything wrong, God wouldn't have a need for Nathan to come to him with that. So it was wrong what he did. And so with us, the counsels and the admonitions and the prophecies given to us through his servants, we have to heed them if we want to save our lives. So Tuesday is, if you, Lord, should mark 
iniquities. Mm. When I read that topic, I started to think, I'll definitely, I, I won't be safe. My, my iniquities are so many. When I think about it, I said, if, I, if the Lord was to mark it, if we were to, what about if we were to bear our iniquities? Mm. That stirred me today. So we are going to look at Psalms 130. And it asks, how are the gravity of sin and hope for sinners portrayed? So this is what we are going to look at. The psalmist's great affliction is related to his own and his people's sin. The people's sin are so grave that they threaten to separate the people from God forever. We know that the Lord cannot dwell in the presence of sin. And oftentimes when Israel go out to battle and they lost, something among them, some sin had caused that. So scripture speaks of the records of sin that are being kept for the judgment day, which we all know according to Daniel 7:10 and Revelation 20. There's a judgment day and there is a record for each and every one of our sins. And if our sins are not blotted out, in that day of judgment, when our name comes up, we are not going to make it. It is going to be a dreadful day indeed. That's why it's called the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So we're also going to look at, think about the question, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? What does that mean to you personally? And where would you be if the Lord marked your iniquities? Quite interesting, isn't it? Psalms 130, we're going to read verses 1 to 8, says, out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait. And his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy and with him is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. This is deep. And I could imagine... Why the Lord say David was a man of his own heart? David did not wait to repent when he see his errors and he see he had erred. And this is where what we have to do too. When you see we realize that we have erred, we so to quickly say, Lord, help me. I wait for thee. There is forgiveness with thee. These are the things that we are to say. To those who have made strange parts for their feet, reading from the book, This Day with God, the Lord offers words of encouragement. He will accept their prayers if they will repent and be converted. Through the infinite sacrifice of Christ and through the faith in his name, they may receive the promises of God. The sons of Adam may become sons of God. Oh, how full of thankfulness we should be that the acts of Christ in assuming humanity, fallen men are granted a second trial. I don't think we, we understand or we really comprehend what is going on here. Christ took on the nature of fallen man <laughs> to save man. Who does that? Mm. Let's continue. Christ placed them on vantage ground. True connection with him, they may be laborers together with God. Through the grace 
given daily by Christ, they may be elevated and ennobled to become the sons and daughters of God. Such love is without parallel. You can't find that anywhere. It doesn't matter how much we say we love our children. We, we can't find that anywhere but with God. But with God. Amen? So we, we have a father that loves, mm -hmm. that loves, that forgives. So there are two main themes of Psalms 130, which I, I believe you pick up, the forgiveness and the weight. So the forgiveness goes on, showing us that sin is a deep abyss from which the sinner cries out to God. When you read Psalms 130 verses 1 and 2, when listening to us, the Lord looks at us and what does he see? What does he see? Think about it. If he fix her eyes on our sins, if he fix, that's his eyes, on our sins, we are finished. Mm. But God's loving eyes are fixed on the repentant sinner and he grants him forgiveness. And that should be capital H. I do apologize for every common letter you see that refers to God himself. The divine attitude generates hope. Therefore, we confidentially wait to receive God's forgiveness. So now we're dealing with the wait, right? Especially wait for the glorious morning in which we hear from his lips. Enter into the joy of the Lord. All of God's people participate in this eager wait when he will redeem Israel from all their sins. Now, think about the question, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand? Which one of us could stand if the Lord marks our iniquities? Hmm. That's why if we don't repent of our sins, uh -huh, we are what? We are not going to make it. What does that mean to you personally? So now we're going to think, where could we be if the Lord marked our iniquities? No, we are just repeating Psalms 130 verses 3 and 4. It says, was, if thou should what? Mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. Aren't you seeing the mercy of God playing out here? Now we're reading from the book Upward Look. Men may say, I forgive all the injuries you have done, on, done to me, but their forgiveness would not blot out one sin, right? This is what we need, the blotting out of sins. When our name comes up, when the judgment of the living begins. But the voice sounded from Calvary, my son, my daughter, thy sins will be forgiven thee, is all efficacious. That word alone has power and awakens the gratitude in the grateful heart. We have a mediator. There is but one channel of forgiveness, and the channel is ever open. <laughs> Isn't this mercy? Isn't this mercy? And through that channel, a rich flow of divine mercy and forgiveness comes pouring down to us. Many have expressed wonder that God demands so many slain victims in sacrificial offerings of the Jews, but it was to rivet their minds the great and solemn truth that without the shedding of blood, there was no remission of sin. Never shall we see and comprehend the intense anguish of the suffering of the spotless Lamb of God until we feel how deep is the pit from which we have been delivered. How grievous the sins of which humanity is guilty. And by faith, grasp the full and entire pardon now let's what's the takeaway let what, what what's the lesson here for us reading from the book testimonies for the church volume 7 inspiration says what 
if you make a mistake, turn your defeat into victory. And oftentimes, we do not turn our defeat into victory. We let our defeat defeat us. The lesson that God sends will always, if well learned, bring help in due time. Put your trust in God. Pray much and believe. Trust in. Hoping, believing, holding fast the hand of infinite power, you will be more than conquerors. And I'm letting these words speak to me because I need them. True walkers walk and walk by faith. Sometimes they grow weary with watching the slow advance of the work when the battle wages strong between the powers of good and evil. But if they refuse to fail or be discouraged, they will see the clouds breaking away and the promise of deliverance fulfilling. And that's where we say, there is a what? Behind every dark cloud, there is a silver lining. Through the mist with which Satan has surrounded them, they will see the shining of the bright beams of the righteousness, of the sun of righteousness. Wait not in fretful anxiety, but in undaunted faith and unshaken trust. This is what we need to do. For the Lord had chosen Jacob unto himself and for his and Israel for his peculiar treasure. For I have known that the Lord is great and that our Lord is what? Is Lord. He's above all gods, all the man-made gods that we have created. He is bigger than that. He is above that. So what does he ask us? Jesus asks for perfect obedience. There must be a thorough, practical work. Daily, we are to increase in the knowledge of the divine will. Christ will impart his spirit to all who will unitedly labor in humility. And we end with our last quotation. We'll, we will hide in Jesus Christ. We will trust in his love. We will believe day by day that he loves us with a love that is infinite. Let nothing, nothing discourage you and make you sad. Think of the goodness of God. So we are going to think now upon his mercies, right? Yes, his love. We count his favors and blessings. May prayers to the Lord always be in our hearts, in our minds, and, our, and on our lips. And this is taken from Lift Up Your Eyes, January 16th. I go over to you, Sister Gibbs. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry. You know, if God should mark iniquities, but he has not marked our iniquities, he treats us far better than we deserve. He looks beyond our faults and see our need. His mercy endures forever. Praise his name. So now we will turn to Wednesday's lesson. Praise to the majestic and merciful God. Praise to the majestic and merciful God. Last week we learned about the majestic warrior. So today we are learning about the majestic and merciful God. The majestic warrior who is merciful. Mm -hmm. Read Psalm 113 and Psalm 123. What two different aspects of God's character are depicted in these Psalms? Well, the lesson here says Psalm 113 and 123 praise both the majesty and mercy of the Lord. The Lord's majesty is revealed in the greatness of his name and in the exalted place of his throne which is above all nations and above the heavens. 
who is like the Lord our God is a statement of faith that no power within or outside of the world can challenge. None can challenge the God of Israel. So we'll be seeking to find the answer to that question, what two different aspects of God's character are depicted in these two passages. And we'll also look at the question at the bottom, what has Jesus saved you from? Now, this is a personal question. Why is it so important to keep the cross foremost in your mind? And as we contemplate the mercy, the, the as we contemplate praise to the majestic and merciful God, brethren, let us keep these, these questions in our thoughts. Let us ponder them and give God the honor and the glory that is due to him. Let's move forward. So we may read these passages that have been given to us here. So Psalm 113, 1 to 9. Praise ye the Lord. Praise all ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with princes, even the princes of his people. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. And these last lines I can remember reading from coming from the lips of Hannah when she was without children. Yes, it was her praise that God had given her children. Now let's read Psalm 123, 1. Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God, until that he have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. I have read this one many a times. Perhaps many of you listening can say the same. These two Psalms are really very beautiful. One asking for mercy and the other one giving praise. Two different aspects of God's character. So let's move forward and get into more details. So the psalmist says, the Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. And inspiration comments, the greatness of God is to us incomprehensible. Yes, we cannot understand it. The Lord's throne is in heaven, yet by his spirit, he is everywhere present. He has an intimate knowledge of and a personal interest in all the works of his hand. So God's interest in you and in me is very personal. He has time for every one of the billions of people in this world. As though there was just one person. So inspiration continues. And that first reading came from the book Education, page 132, paragraph 2. So now we'll read from Sons and Daughters, page 19. It is not the manifestation of God's great and awful majesty and unparalleled power that will leave us without excuse if we refuse him our love and obedience. It is the love, the compassion, the patience, the long-suffering that he has shown which will witness against those who do not offer him the willing service of their lives. Those who turn to God with heart and soul and mind will find in him peaceful security. So you want to find security? 
turn to the Lord. You want to find peaceful security? Turn to the Lord. More for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Psalm 107 verse 8. My internet is misbehaving. Friends, let me just see if I can straighten it out here a bit. All right, let's go again. From Sons and Daughters of God, page 19. It is not the manifestation of God's great and awful majesty and unparalleled power that will leave us without excuse if we refuse him our love and obedience. It is the love, the compassion, the patience, the long suffering that he has shown which will witness against those who do not offer him the willing service of their lives. Those who turn to God with heart and soul and mind will find in him peaceful security. So again, if we want to have peaceful security, let's turn to God with our entire being wholeheartedly for a promise and his promise is sure. No steps to Christ, page 102, par sorry, page 102 and 103. Let's read. We need to praise God more for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. We are the constant recipients of God's mercies. And earlier on, Sister Cherry had asked, what if he should cut off his mercies from us? We would perish. Yes. So we need to give him more praise. We are the constant recipients of his grace, so we need to praise him more. And yet, inspiration says, how little gratitude we express. How little we praise him for what he has done for us. We must gather about the cross. Christ and him crucified should be the theme of contemplation, of conversation, and of our most joyful emotion. We should keep in our thoughts every blessing we receive from God. And when we realize his great love, we should be willing to trust everything to the hand that, has, that was nailed to the cross for us. For if he gave his only son, the Bible says, he will give everything else for us. He will not withhold anything from us, for he had not withheld his son, his most precious son. So we need to give him all the praise that is due to him. Remember, we look at the beast and the, we look at the occupants of the judgment room and we saw that they were all praising God. Yes, even the angels that had never fallen. So we need to praise him, brethren. Let's move forward and get into more details. Praise and trust, yes. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. What reasons do Psalms 113 and 123 give us to praise and trust in the Lord? 1134, because it is exalted above heaven and earth. Praise is due unto the Lord, yes? He is exalted above heaven and earth. Psalm 1135 to 6. Because although he lives on high, he humbles himself and comes down to our level. One up Psalm 1137 to 8, because he lifts up the poor and the needy. 1139, because he performs marvelous miracles. And 23, 123, that is, because he has mercy on us when we are despised. So God is truly merciful. From the rising of the sun unto the going down to the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Conflict and Courage 365.1 On the cross, we can see together all these divine attributes. His great love led Jesus to humble himself unto death for us. Philippians 2.8 Is he not worthy of praise? Shall we not fully trust in, his, in this powerful and loving Savior? Yes, we need to trust him fully. He gave himself for us. Nothing that we have could have bought our salvation, but Christ gave himself 
as the payment for our pardon. So we need to trust him. Let's move forward. And this will be our final comment from Conflict and Courage 365, paragraph 2. And it says, the Bible has little to say in praise of men. Little space is given to recounting the virtues of even the best men who have ever lived. This silence is not without purpose. It is not without a lesson. All the good qualities that men possess are the gift of God. Their good deeds are performed by the grace of God through Christ. You see, brethren, we could not do a good deed unless God had helped us. For we know not in ourselves how to do good. So inspiration continues. Since they owe all to God, the glory of whatever they are or do belongs to him alone. They are but instruments in his hands. More than this, as all the lessons of Bible history teach, it is a perilous thing to praise or exalt men. For if one comes to lose sight of his entire dependence on God and to trust to his own strength, he is sure to fall. So when we praise men, what happens? Pride builds up in them. Yes, when men praise us, pride builds up in us and we forget God. We forget that all that we have and are belongs to him. And we will be certainly going down to perdition. Brethren, to God, for he is worthy and his mercy is endureth forever. Sister Cherry, it's over to you. God bless you. Thank you very much, Sister Aiken. So we're going to go straight over into Thursday. And Thursday is forget not all his benefits. Hmm. We're going to read Psalms 103. How is God's mercy portrayed here? And I like the topic. The topic is catchy to you and to me. Forget not all his benefits. Oftentimes we do. And we have seen it in the past with Israel. God will come true for them and then they will just forget. And he will come true for them and they will just forget. Now, we're reading at the bottom here from Inspiration. In the desire of ages, it said it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day to contemplate of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp the scene. You know how we sit down and we think about things and we visualize it sometimes? We have to do it, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant our love will be more will be quickened and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit if we would be saved at last we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross now we're going to read psalm chapter 103 bless the lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities? Who healeth all thy dis diseases? Who re redeemeth thy life from destruction? Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles? The Lord executed righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his act unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He had not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is higher, above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far had you removed our transgression from us. Like as a father pitied his child, his children, so the Lord pitied him that fear him. For, it says, for he knoweth our frame, 
he redeemed it, he remembered, sorry, that we are thus. As far as for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourished. That's it. That's how we are. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto the children's children. To such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord had prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom ruled over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angel, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearken unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. And the last verse is, bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh, my soul. How often those who are in health, forget the wonderful mercies that are continued to them day by day, year after year. They render no tribute of praise to God for all these benefits. But when sickness comes, God is remembered. The strong desire for recovery leads to earnest prayer, and this is right. God is our refuge in sickness as in health. When the ten lepers were healed, only one return to find Jesus and give him glory. Let us not be like the unthinking man whose hearts were untouched by the mercy of God. Are our hearts touched by God's mercy? Hmm. So we are told to praise the Lord. We are told to forget not all his benefits, right? What benefits does the Lord give us? We read it in Psalms 103. He forgives my iniquities, heal my ailments, rescue my life from the pit. He crowns me with favors and love. He satisfies me with good. He rejuvenates me. He does justice when I suffer violence. He makes his plan known to me. He loves me and will not be angry with me if we are obedient that is he does not repay me according to my sins as we did in our last on wednesday and tuesday he does not remember our sins because just as it says from the east to the west he knows that i will soon pass away and he have mercy on me in response to these kindness, we join the angels in blessing the Lord. Praise begins when one recognizes the majesty and works of God and responds in worship to his goodness, to his mercy, and wisdom. All right. Now, in view of all that God has wrought for us. Our faith should be strong, active, and enduring. If your faith was weak when you started the Sabbath school lesson, I am hoping that now it has strengthened. So instead of us murmuring and complaining, we are told the language of our hearts should be, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. This is what should be our language. Our Heavenly Father, we continue in our Christ subject lesson, requires no more, no less than he has given us ability to do. He lays upon his servants no burden that they are not able to bear. He knoweth our friend. He remembereth that we are thus. All that he claims for us, we through divine grace can render. Councils on hell tells us the Lord doth not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. Lamentations 3 and verse 33. Like as a father pitied his children, so the Lord 
pity at them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remember that we are dust. Psalms 1 and 3, 13 and 14, as we just read. He knows our heart, but he reads every secret of the soul. So what I'm hiding in my heart now, the Lord knows. He knows whether or not those for whom petitions are offered would be able to endure the trial and test that would come upon them if they live. So sometimes we pray, Lord, bring back this person that is sick. Bring them to life, but the Lord is putting them to rest because they, they will not be able to bear what is coming. And God, in his mercy and love, he laid them to rest, but we don't see that. But he knows. His servants are as dear to him as the apple of the eye. In trial, in want, in perplexity, and distress, we are not alone. At every step, in tones of assurance, he bids us, follow me. I will never leave, nor forsake thee. Manuscript releases. Release. Volume 12. Page 150. Sister Higgins, over to you. Before we end here on Thursday. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry. The manifold mercies of God towards us, his rebellious people, it is unfathomable. Friday, read in Steps to Christ, the sinner's need of Christ. In the Psalms, the voices of God's people join as one in repeating the chorus, his mercy endures forever, in celebration of God's eternal love. And th those are the passages in which we can find it recorded. Not to praise God would men would not to praise God, sorry, would mean to forget all his benefits, not to appreciate God's gifts. Only those who praise do not forget. Thinking and speaking about God is not yet praising him. Praise begins when one acknowledges God's majesty and works and responds. <coughs> sorry, let me read that again. Praise begins when one acknowledges God's majesty and works and responds with adoration of his goodness, mercy, and wisdom. So when we accept, when we acknowledge God's goodness to us, we sing him praises, we give him thanks. Yes? So we invite you to read the rest of what is written here on the Friday, as we move forward to our last and final comments for this lesson. And reading from Reflecting Jesus, December 3, you must not sink down discouraged. The faint-hearted will be made strong. The desponding will be made to will be made to hope. God has a tender care for his people. His ear is open unto their cry. I have no fears for God's cause. He will take care of his own cause. Our duty is to fill our lot and place, live humble at the foot of the cross, and live faithful, holy lives before him. While we do this, we shall not be ashamed, but our souls will confide in God with holy boldness. My heart is fixed, trusting in God. We have a whole Savior. We can rejoice in his rich fullness. I long to be more devoted to God, more consecrated to him. And this is inspiration's thoughts expressed here, and it should be our thoughts too. We should be longing to do more for God, to be more devoted to the cause of God. Brethren, there is nothing for us to fear. We need to be praising God over and over and over again. For his mercy endureth forever. God bless you. Sister Cherry, will you please close us with prayer? Let us pray. Our kind and heavenly Father, we are truly thankful, Lord, that you have been with us throughout this lesson. We pray, Lord, for our viewers, those who come by each and every week, to study the lesson with us and prepare ourselves as we go into your house of prayer on Sabbath and be a blessing to our brethren. We thank you, Lord, for being faithful and mercy to us. We are reminded of your mercy. Help us, the Lord, that we will continually offer praise and gratitude to you. 
because you are worthy of it. Continue to be with us. Guide and protect us and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we say bye from Summer School, brethren, until next time.